Hello and welcome to my executive summary on formative feedback. One of the practices of my district is to use this book by Charlotte Danielson called Enhancing Professional Practice, a Framework for Teaching. And in this book, she outlines four domains of teaching. They are planning and preparation, classroom environment, instruction, and professional responsibilities. And every year we're asked to pick an area of focus from one of these domains. And this last year I looked at instruction, and under instruction one of the components was student feedback. So that really led me to my research question of what is formative feedback? And I really wanted to know how does feedback fit in with formative assessment? How do those two things go together? I wanted to know what are the essentials of formative feedback and really um, what makes effective feedback? What types of things make it effective? And then because I'm a second grade teacher, I had my lens was elementary age students when I was doing this research. So even though my research centers around feedback, I began with formative assessment because feedback really is an important part of the formative assessment process. You can see Colleen and McMillan write, that effective teachers use formative assessment during instruction to identify specific student misunderstandings, provide feedback to students, and help identify and implement instructional correctives. Giving good feedback really is one of the skills that teachers need as a part of good formative assessment. And again on these next two slides you can see the key practices of formative assessment. And one of those key practices is offering feedback. So why do I care about formative assessment and why is it important to me? Well, you can see it's important because it enhances student learning, it increases student self-confidence and self-esteem, and it actively involves students in the learning process. And these are all things that I want to continue to see in my classroom. It's also interesting to note this final quote on formative assessment that it is the most powerful single moderator that enhances achievement. Again, remember that a key practice of the formative assessment process is offering good feedback. Look at this quote though at the bottom of the page. It says, feedback is one of the most instructionally powerful and least understood features in the instructional design. So it's important that we understand the importance of offering formative feedback to our students. We need to learn the most effective ways to do so. So what exactly is formative feedback? It's information communicated to the learner intended to modify their thinking with the purpose of improving learning. It's formative when um, students are engaged in their thinking and they're supported to think about, to think that way. They understand where they are in a process. And again, this is that constructivist. They're active owners of their learning. I love that last point because I don't want my teaching to be all about me. It's about my students, their insights, and their learning. What does the research say about using formative feedback? Most of these points were taken from a meta-analysis conducted on the use of formative feedback. And you can see that effective feedback produces significant benefits in learning. It's a significant factor in motivating learning. It equals deeper student engagement, and it raises expectations for student success. So the functions of feedback. Um, it nurtures academic advancement. It addresses and explains those student misconceptions. It allows time for you to model, and it's motivational for kids. So, now we're going to talk about the essentials and what is effective feedback. And we're going to begin with formative feedback has to be goal referenced. So students have to know what good performance is and how their current performance relates to a criteria or a standard. But then they also have to know what can I do to close that gap? What steps can I take from here? And I think this is one of the most important things that was referenced over and over and over again, that feedback should be goal referenced. So you should have a goal, you should have some sort of criteria. In back. 
It's also tangible and transparent, actionable, so specific enough where they know what they need to do, useful, user-friendly, timely. Teachers should work overtime to figure out ways to ensure that students get more opportunities to use feedback while it is still fresh in their mind. I love that quote, and I have this posted in my room now. But it's just to remind me that it is really essential that I give timely feedback. And then feedback, effective feedback is also ongoing so that kids can adapt and learn from it. And I also thought this was really interesting that effective feedback is consistent. And there was a study conducted by Brinko where students who received credible negative feedback, so feedback that was credible but it wasn't maybe great feedback, they actually set higher goals and performed tasks at higher levels than those who received less credible negative feedback. So even when the feedback is negative, if it's coming from a credible source, students are using it and setting higher goals. These are just some other things that I found interesting that feedback's more effective when it's gathered from yourself as well as from others, when it's perceived as positive, when it's concrete and it has concrete information that kids can use, and again, when it's considered as a process, not just a one-time fix. So these following strategies come from the Susan M. Brookhart book that Jay referenced on our forum called How to Give Effective Feedback to Your Students. And I would really recommend this book if you want to learn more about feedback. It's really user-friendly and it's a quick read. So she outlines these strategies and the first is feedback timing. So when do you give feedback? And kind of the two things to keep in mind are you want to give feedback when students are still mindful of the learning targets and when there's still time to act on it. So examples of this would be returning a test or assignment the next day or immediately addressing student misconceptions. The feedback amount focuses on how much feedback should I give. Brookhart tells us that for real learning to take place, you need a usable amount that connects with what students already know and takes them to the next level of understanding. So the Goldilocks principle is that just right amount, and this will vary case by case, and it just depends. You don't want too much, you don't want too little, but you want the perfect amount, enough so that students know what to do, but not where the work has been done for them. Some things to consider might be selecting two or three specific learning targets, maybe focusing on what the student has done well, or maybe thinking about certain things that are coming up in the future that you might need to pre-teach for students. So the mode focuses on how you give feedback to students, and really your goal is to communicate in the most effective way. And um, oral feedback, Brookhart notes that some of the best feedback comes as a result of student conversation, where you're asking probing questions and you're facilitating a discussion with students. But sometimes we don't have time to do that as, a t as teachers, so then written feedback maybe would be the quickest way to communicate with students. An interesting thing to note is that in my research I found there was no difference between unstructured or structured feedback. This is just talking about who you're giving feedback to. Um, sometimes it's an individual basis, in fact that's probably best, but it also could benefit a group of students. And you really want to avoid giving the same comments to the same students. And the content of feedback, it focuses on work and progress. It relates to a goal. It's descriptive and positive. So it's describing strengths that match the learning criteria. And then these were specific strategies that I thought were really interesting. And the two in red are the two that I want to go back into my classroom and do. But the first one is providing feedback on a work in progress. So it's not a final evaluation. Um, the two-stage assignment is actually having an assignment in two stages so that your stage one, the kids know up front, if I'm going to give you feedback in stage one, that's going to help you with stage two. Of course, modeling strategies, including action points, here's how you can improve. And then having the kids identify their own action points and receive feedback from the teacher. And this is something I want to focus more in on and try. This was just from the student perspective. Um, this research came from an article on students' perception of the quality and effectiveness of feedback. 
So you can see they put a high value in, on it and they didn't like it when it was late. Poor quality. So really in summary, good formative feedback helps clarify what good performance is. It delivers high quality information to students provides them with the opportunity to close the gap between their current performance and the desired performance, which again is reference to criteria or some sort of standard. Um, good feedback, feedback encourages teacher and peer dialogue. And then feedback also provides you with information that can help to shape your own practice. Thank you for listening. And again, um, I have three reference pages here, but the one in red is the book that I made mention of early that if you're looking for a feedback book, this would be one that you might want to consider.